the Understanding Crime module, and we're now on to lecture 11, which will be addressing issues of media and crime and the way in which crime is reported in the media. So we'll have a, little, a bit of a look at that and offer some, <coughs> excuse me, some assignment support around the media analysis, the final um, piece of coursework that you need to hand in. So in terms of the assignment support for this last bit of coursework, um, it's a thousand words in length, so relatively straightforward. Now, the theoretical layout, and I say theoretical because not every one of these four aspects will necessarily apply to every single um, work of fiction. So you may only need to use two, maybe three of these because not every um, film or TV show is going to cover all four of these angles in a relevant way. So the four possible relevant angles you can cover in terms of what you look at. Um, your opening paragraph should just be a very short summation of what the film or episode of a TV show is that you're looking at. Now, if you're going to look at a series, you know, one of these long running TV shows that has hundreds of episodes, pick one episode and explain that one episode. Don't try and explain the whole show, all 500 odd episodes of it, just one episode. So once you've made your decision, um, a paragraph saying uh, when this was aired, what the episode or the film or, or, or what have you is about, you might, if it seems relevant, mention who the key actors are in the film. In terms of citation, use the IMBD website, which, um, whilst not actually an academic website, is the accepted standard for recording information about films and TV shows in terms of things like the, the dates when they aired and who appeared in them, who wrote the episode, who directed the episode, all of that kind of stuff can be accounted for on the IMBD website. So if the show goes into some degree of detail about the victim, or there might be a whole series of victims if it's a serial killer program or something, then you can choose to talk about the victim. Um, now, what you're not doing is offering a film critique saying how good the acting was or how bad the script was or any of that. Rather, what you're looking at is how closely fictional crime on TV or at the cinema compares to real life crime. So you could, for example, talk about victim demographics. Now, a, a common feature of a lot of films and TV shows, to give you an example of how this would work, um, often involve pretty young actresses, um, frequently not wearing a great deal of clothing, being menaced by sinister men in ski masks who break into their apartment, rape them, murder them, do whatever it is that they're going to do to them. Um, it is violence committed against young women um, by men who are usually unknown to them, the, the random stranger, the random pervert. The vast majority of real life violent crime, both in terms of assaults and murders, is uh, directed against men. The majority of, of victims of violent crime are male, and the majority of perpetrators of violent crimes are male. And usually, um, for domestic violent crime, it's a man known to the victim, a friend, a relative. And the majority of street crime, it's somebody unknown. In other words, it's a pub fight, something in that vein, where, where drunk men get out of hand and, and clobber each other or stab each other or bottle one another, or whatever it is that they're going to get up to. However, if you watch a lot of TV, you, you'd walk away thinking, that the majority of victims of violence are women and therefore if you yourself were a woman you might be intimidated and afraid by that or if you if even indeed if you're a male viewer if you have daughters sisters mothers grandmothers wives then you might be worried on their behalf and perceive them as potential victims because that's what the tv keeps telling you that women are potential victims of r violence committed by random men now on those situations where women are in real life the victims of violence, by and large, most of the people carrying out the violence are known to them. They're not random weirdos in ski masks who break into their houses. Obviously, it does happen 
there are random strangers who, who attack people and wound them. But the vast majority of violence is from someone known, again, a, a relative, a friend, someone they've been on a date with, that kind of a situation. So it, it's not that necessarily the type of crimes presented in TV are so weird, so unusual, they've never happened in real life, with the possible exception of Midsummer Murders, which is very weird and very strange. Um, rather, it's the, the constant repetition of certain themes, certain tropes, which is a TV jargon for a theme, basically, a repeated image. It's the consistency of the image across loads and loads and loads of shows and films that creates the false impression. Um, the chances are practically any show or film you look at to do with crime is going to involve a victim and would involve a criminal. So those first two paragraphs are, are pretty, sorry, not paragraphs, first two um, bullet points are going to be pretty much consistent no matter what you're looking at in terms of which film, which TV show. So the, you could look at the criminal. How is the criminal presented? Um, you could think of the criminal from a demographic angle. What race are they? What gender are they? That sort of thing. How well that fits with the known real life patterns of the particular type of crime we're looking at whether that crime is murder or bank robbing or arson or whatever it might be. What do we know of the people who tend to commit that type of crime in real life compared to the TV version of it? Um, you, you can think in terms of, for example, the motivational factors of the character. Is this character presented as committing a crime for vengeance or for material gain? or because they are mentally unwell and they are just sort of hallucinating things and they're lashing out at people. Which again, potentially you could look at the understandings of, in real life, of how mental illness becomes a factor in crime or the motivating factors behind the majority of crime. So a, a huge chunk of crime is motivated by, by greed. Um, people stealing goods, um, funding drug habits, that essentially crime is motivated by money and the wish for money. Whereas if you look at a lot of fictional crime, then often the motivations are quite convoluted. Sometimes it is as straightforward as pushing granddad down the staircase in order to get the inheritance. But quite often a lot of crime, again, we're getting into the kind of midsummer murders, Agatha Christie territory, where the motivations can be quite convoluted, quite strange and not the kind of motivations you're likely to find in very many real life crime cases. Is there an investigator? That investigator could be a police officer, could be a private detective of the sort of Sherlock Holmes, Miss Marple variety, um, could be a whole range of possible people who are looking into the crime. If the police are represented in the show, then um, how are they represented? Is it a realistic view of the police? Um, do they always catch the villain? Inevitably, practically every, oh, well, there are some exceptions, but practically every film or TV show you look at that involves crime will involve a resolution to the crime where the villain will be identified and, and dealt with. In real life, a large swathe of crimes go unpunished. The, 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 the criminal gets off with it, gets away with it, and they're not caught. But that doesn't make for good TV. We kind of like TV shows where the clever detective finds out who did it and justice is done. Real life isn't always like that. Um, you might, if you're looking at that's maybe something like uh, a 1970s cop show, something like The Sweeney, for those, older, for those of you old enough to remember that, or one of the, these um, nostalgic pieces like Life on Mars. Um, the police in those eras were often presented as quite heavy-handed, slapping the, the criminals around, getting very rough, very ready. Is that a representation? It might have been true of the 1970s police forces. Um, has that changed? Are modern-day police forces less physically aggressive towards suspects? Um, than they were back in, let's say, the 1970s. So you could look at possible historical issues. How has the criminal justice system, how has crime investigation changed in the intervening period of time? Um, some shows, not all of them, 
will deal with the criminal justice itself. So it might involve, during the film or the show, um, a, a courtroom trial. It might involve scenes set in a prison um, following the conviction of the suspect or... or, or Indeed, it, I suppose it could, the whole thing could be set in a prison. You could be looking at the prison drama. Um, so again, how is the understanding of the criminal justice its system itself shown the, the, the TV version compared to the real life version of the criminal justice system? So you're exploring those issues. You're bringing in statistics to back up. Well, the TV version says this type of person commits a crime. However, the statistics show that 55% of all arsonists are in fact like this. So you'd be bringing in a little bit of statistics, potentially. You might be bringing in a little bit of sociological theory. Well, I say you might be. Please do bring in some sociological theory where you can say that um, the impact of watching this type of media on a regular basis might, for example, go back to that earlier point we made, um, cause female viewers to be anxious for their own safety because so many TV shows, films portray young women as victims of predatory street crime and that sort of thing. Um, so you might talk about why does the media portray women as potential victims? Now, whether that is you drawing on, let's say, feminist sociological theory or whether it's you drawing upon more criminological sociological theory to say that... Um, yeah, the perpetuation of fear, it sells media. Uh, it, it's, there's a, a financial gain to the media to be had from making people anxious, inducing moral panics, that sort of thing. You could tackle that from a number of different angles, a number of different issues. And of course, some, some shows um, specialize in addressing the big issues of the day. So you might have a crime that's racially motivated you might have a crime centered around terrorism. You might have a crime centered around paedophile rings or something like that. Something that's been in the papers that's quite a controversial issue in the period of time in which the show or film has been made. And therefore the show is trying to be all, all edgy by tackling a um, serious issue of the day. And you could look at the TV version of that serious issue versus the what is known of the real life um, version, as it were, of the serious issue. And that serious issue may well very easily be something to which sociological theory can be applied. So that's where you get your, your higher grade by combining a bit of statistics to back up why real life crime is often very different from TV fictional crime, and also bringing in sociological theory to explain a little bit about the nature of the crime itself, but also perhaps the impact of watching this style of fictional representation, which gives a somewhat skewed understanding of crime. Why is it giving a skewed understanding of crime? And that will, of course, depend quite a lot on the nature of the show you're looking at. Um, so it is possible to look at novels, but I'm suggesting TV film shows are much easier simply because to look at a novel, you'd have to read it. Now, it could be one you've already read months ago and you're very familiar with that story, and that's brilliant. But obviously, if you were setting out to read something new, that's very, very time consuming. Whereas you could sit down and watch a show in half an hour or an hour and get a grip on it that way. So I would suggest the film or TV show, that type of fiction, is probably a lot more accessible for you at the moment with lockdown and everything else than a very time-consuming reading of a novel and try to explain the novel. So you could pick one of those TV shows there, and some of them are much grittier than others. Some of them are much more realistic than others. And that's only a, a, a set of possible suggestions. There's tons of other films and TV shows out there that you might prefer to watch instead that would be much more um, to your taste. So obviously, if you are going for a, a Miss Marple mystery, that's probably going to be a lot twee a lot more unrealistic than, let's say, something like um, The Bill or A Touch of Frost which tries to go much more police procedural and tries to be closer to what real life policing is like. It doesn't always succeed, but it tries to be closer to real life policing issues than, let's say, an Agatha Christie story it tends to be a lot more sort of chocolate box and whimsical. So just pick a show. If you're not sure what to go for, do ask me and I can make suggestions to you. Or if you've got a couple of possible things in mind and you're not too sure which one to go to, 
contact me and say, should I do A, B or C? And I'll give you my two penny worth system, which I think would be easiest for you and perhaps suggest some relevant sociological theories you could look at with respect to the, um, the, the particular show or the particular film that I'd recommend out of your list of choices. Okay. Let's put that aside because we can always engage in more discussion of assignments via the class chat or, or something of that sort, some type of social media chat. Then go on to some of the theories you might want to include in explaining uh, the nature of um, media representation of crime. So there are a couple of, of um, dominant theories that hold sway in understandings of, of the media in general, not solely in terms of, of crime reporting, but the media in general. And, um, so all of these theories predate the development of social media. So when these theories were talking about media, they were talking about newspapers, radio um, and television news in due course. And back in the day when we had things like Pathé news, which was shown in cinemas along with the film itself, you'd get a newsreel. That's going back a long, old time. Um, th this does mean that other sociologists have come in, come along the, the, the uh, kind of younger end of the sociological market who have said, well, do these theories apply to social media, the internet, etc., or do they need changing, adapting to incorporate the realities of the internet and social media these days? We'll get onto those ideas as we go along. But the classic ideas, um, Harold Laswell advanced what is sometimes referred to as the hypodermic syringe model, it's also referred to as the magic bullet model. Um, the idea behind this is that a bit like a syringe injecting a, a medicine into something. The media, um, I think we are mostly talking newspapers, really, in Laswell's life, well, back in the 1920s when Laswell was putting the idea out there, mainly newspapers um, and radio, they put the media puts ideas into the reader or listener's head and effectively tells them what to think now you can narrow this down a bit in the sense of when we say media that's a very broad woolly term who actually are we talking about you could say the editor of the newspaper you could say the individual journalist writing the article or presenting the, the show on the radio or indeed you could say the owner of the newspapers the, the tycoon who might indeed own several different newspapers and radio stations and other media outlets, are kind of uh, the Rupert Murdochs of the 1920s, who owned extensive media outlets and controlled the political agendas through their choice of appointing editors and telling the editors which way the wind was blowing and which way to jump, it creates an agenda. Now, just as these days you have right-wing newspapers and left-wing newspapers and vaguely in the centre newspapers, so it was exactly the same case back in the 1920s. You had newspapers on various different sides of the political spectrum promoting different views. Um, and that Laswell's idea effectively is that, put it in the modern context, people like Rupert Murdoch, the Barclay brothers, um, others who own newspaper empires and TV empires and, and so forth, are rather like puppet masters pulling the strings of Joe Public and telling us what we should be believing, what we should be thinking. And we just sit here lapping it all up and believing what we're told to believe, thinking what we're told to think. That argument stayed in for a fair old time, um, but was challenged in the course of time, particularly the notion that the public is quite as passive and um, easily put upon as Laswell thought they were. Now, this could be because Laswell simply had a misunderstanding of the nature of the public, or it could be an issue of time, that the way the public were in 1920 is different from the way the public were in, let's say, 1960 or 1970. And so as the public changed, maybe their relationship with the media changed. So it could be that Laswell was giving a fairly accurate description of the way things were in the 20s, but that the world moved on and newer theories were required. But whatever the case may be on that one, suffice to say, other theories developed which did not see the public as being quite that 
um, passive and that inert. Um, one of the key voices in that changing view of the public was uh, Joseph Clapper, and unfortunately, a bit of one, who developed selective exposure theory, who effectively said that um, a right-wing member of the public is not going to go out and buy a left-wing newspaper and read it. Or if they do, they'll probably just use it to learn the budgie cage. They won't pay very much attention to it. Likewise, a very left-wing member of the public isn't going to go out and buy a right-wing newspaper. We buy the newspapers that tell us what we want to hear. So if you read a newspaper, you know, you're sitting in the doctor's waiting room, you just pick up the first paper that's on the table, and you don't like what you read, you'll not be out going out and buying that newspaper because it doesn't appeal to you. It's not putting out opinions you want to hear. You're getting all hot under the collar and irate and disagreeing with the journalists as you're reading it. Therefore, you will no longer consume that newspaper. So the public, in effect, are leading the journalists. The journalists, at the end of the day, and this is a key element of Clapper's argument, it's also a key element of Noam Chomsky's argument we'll get onto as we go along, is that why do newspaper empires and TV empires and all the rest of it, why do they exist? They exist at the absolute bedrock end of to make money and a hell of a lot of money. How do they make money? By selling their product, the same as anyone who manufactures chocolate bars or shoes or computers or whatever the hell they manufacture. They are selling to the public, therefore you've got to find out what the public wants. Now, to some extent, you can try and convince the public to want this thing, to want that thing, and to some extent that will succeed. I mean, that's the whole bedrock of advertising. If advertising didn't work, they wouldn't spend billions and billions on it. However, it can only succeed in a, in a limited way to a point when it comes to news, because selling news is not quite the same as selling chocolate bars and shoes. It's in a slightly different category. It involves a, a greater degree of critical thought on the part of the, the news consumer and part of the purchaser. So people will buy the papers that tell them what they want to hear. So they've already decided ahead of time what they want to hear, and they will go out and seek a journalist that tells them about that. Or it might be, it, and that can be understood in terms of left-wing, right-wing, centrist politics, but it can also be understood in terms of topic matter. So someone who is mad keen on sports will go out and buy a newspaper that's got a lot of information about sports in it. Somebody else who doesn't give a... a flying donut about sports but is very interested in um, finances and the stock market will go out and buy a newspaper like the financial times which contains an awful lot of information about um, transactions on the stock market and so forth but says very little about sport so we are we choose both by the left wing white wing centrist element of our politics but we are also but choosing papers and media by subject matter, that it tells us about that thing we want to know about. And we are equally put off, perhaps, by news that may start to shift and change and tell us, start telling us about things we've got no interest in. Um, so, for example, the BBC news has got increasingly more and more focused on celebrity news, which is a, not an issue that interests me in the slightest, but will undoubtedly interest other people. So it shifts and changes as to which form of news outlet a particular person will be interested in as that news outlet chops and changes what it puts out there. Um, maybe it's a, a newspaper is brought out by a rival and goes from being a left-wing paper to a right-wing paper or vice versa. And so as the politics and the agendas of newspapers and TV stations and so forth change, so the types of people who will want to consume it also change and shift about. So it's understanding the kind of market elements of mass media. Um, alongside this, we have the theories of Stan Cohen, who did, well, had a number of theories. One of them we'll look at in momentarily around moral panics and ideas around moral panics. But a part of that, the kind of a lead in to the ideas on moral panics, was what he termed the amplification model that what might start out as a fairly minor worry or a fairly minor concern 
could be amplified and magnified by the amount of attention a newspaper or a TV station or whatever type of news outlet will give to it. The more attention they give to it, the more the consuming public are likely to start worrying about it because they keep getting told about it. And that's almost regardless of whether we're looking at right wing, left wing, or any other wing to the paper. Um, if you are a consumer of news and all of a sudden the news goes on more and more and more about a particular subject, let's go for the, the subject of the moment, coronavirus, then you might start out thinking, oh, well, this is a flash in the pan, it doesn't matter. But by the time the news has gone on about it for the 20th occasion, that's when you as the consumer of news start thinking, oh, there must be something really serious here because they keep going on and on about it. So even if you weren't remotely interested in that issue the first time you heard it, by the 20th time you've heard about it, your concerns about the issue have been amplified. Now, whether the amplification is justified, we might argue in the case of pandemics, it certainly is justified, or whether there will be occasions on which it's not justified, and the newspaper is winding people up to a frenzy about nothing. And that can certainly happen. I'm sure we can all sit and think of occasions where newspapers have, have wound people up no end and it's all turned out to be a bit of a damp squib. That happens too. And, and so a little bit like the boy who cried wolf, you can't always be entirely sure with media panics in the newspapers whether they are reliable panics or not. Often you don't know until afterwards when it's all a bit too late and that's when you realise whether it was a lot of hot air about nothing or it really was as bad as the papers made it out to be. Give some examples of moral panics and concerns and anxieties that have been whipped up um, in the press, in newspapers, TV stations, radio stations, and of course social media um, outlets, which brings in other issues which we'll get onto momentarily. Um, the concern about video nasties. That was a huge thing back in the 80s and into the 90s and still raise its head every now and then. Um, worries about media violence, cinematic violence. Are there certain films that will corrupt the viewers, particularly very young viewers, uh, make them become aggressive, make them become violent, become violent, go out and do horrible, awful things? Um, there was attempts in the newspaper back in the, when the Jamie Bolger case occurred, that particular crime, which linked the viewing habits of the two 10 year old boys who'd committed the horrible crime to the fact that they committed the horrible crime. In other words, effectively suggesting that they'd sat at home watching all sorts of horror films and chainsaw killers, and including this particular film posting you've got here, the child's play um, films, about the doll that comes to life and kills people, um, that they'd seen these and watching these films had unhinged those two lads to the point where they'd gone out and murdered Jamie Bolger. Uh, was that the case? seems highly unlikely now. You know, lots and lots of people watch horrible films and including very young kids watch horrible films. The vast majority of them do not go out and murder anyone. So we've got to conclude perhaps that there were lots of other very serious issues in those boys' lives, of which maybe watching lots and lots of gory films had been a part. It doesn't mean it's not a part at all just because it's not the key part. It doesn't mean it isn't a part. Perhaps it had desensitised them, brutalised them, given them an appetite for doing horrible things themselves. Um, but other factors clearly would have triggered them off from just watching nasty films to wanting to go out and commit actual gruesome crimes. Um, Marilyn Manson has been taken to court on a number of occasions, um, never successfully. The cases have always failed. But um, people, uh, parents quite often, who are worried that if their teenagers listen to Marilyn Manson songs, that it will have this deleterious effect that warps their minds and makes them violent or suicidal or gets them onto drugs and, and makes them hopeless and miserable and despairing. Um, I can't say as I've ever listened to a Marilyn Manson song in my life, so I've got no idea what they're like. But it is a worry for a lot of parents in America and other parts of the world. And some of them have taken him to court, and as I say, never succeeded. Those cases have always been shut down. 
that it's the same kind of worry that exposure to media, certain forms of media, certain forms of entertainment, has a major impact on the viewer. Whether it's to make them murderously violent or whether it's to make them suicidal, depressed, etc. That's that's you know, it depends on the nature of the the media in question. Um, and it's not just Marilyn Manson. There's been various bands over the years where he said, "Oh, well, these lyrics will corrupt the young," or the the there's a fad a while ago, going back a few decades, um, back to the days of vinyl records that if you played the record backwards, certain records if played backwards would reveal satanic messages that would send the listener crackers. All sorts of moral panics emerge and usually turn out to be a load of hot air about nothing. Um, into the internet and gaming age, we get lots of concerns about things like Grand Theft Auto, which has been a topic of certain court cases where um, there have been individuals, uh, teenage night in America, for example, who went out and murdered a policeman, shot him, um, for no other reason. Apparently, he said in the case, than he wanted, he played Grand Theft Auto an awful lot, which is a very grand computer game, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, and he just enjoyed it, and he wanted to do it in real life. And this led to all sorts of debates in the court case and in the media and, and the TV shows and what have you about whether or not kids should be allowed to play these games. Was it warping them, damaging them, inciting them to real life crime? The same kinds of arguments recycle and recycle. It's just whether it's a film or a record or a, a video game, chops and changes, but essentially the same fundamental anxieties are expressed by parents, by society at large about certain forms of media that appear to glorify violence and um, nihilism and, and, and kind of go on and on about how awful life is, how pointless life is. Is that a genuine concern, uh, rather like a Kuwait's argument in psychology, that if you say something often enough, it starts to take effect? Tell someone they're beautiful enough, they'll start to believe it. Tell someone they're ugly enough, often enough, they'll start to believe it and it will take effect. So is this constant exposure to repeated notions a genuine concern? Something for discussion and debate there, perhaps. We, 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 something we could talk about maybe one of the chat facilities or something. Um, there are other concerns that get flagged up. For example, a number of feminists, sociologists and other um, academics have expressed concerns that games like Grand Theft Auto often objectify the female characters and encourage violence against female characters in the film. Um, I remember one particular feminist talking about, I'm pretty sure it was Grand Theft Auto, she was talking about that characters could hire prostitutes in the film and then rather than pay them at the end of their uh, transactions, um, beat them to death instead with a baseball bat. And this was of great concern to her that this would promote contempt towards women, hatred of women, and so forth. Similar argument, I suppose, to the child's play argument, to the Marilyn Manson argument, but here gender specific. So uh, that particular academic wasn't as concerned about uh, the encouragement of violence towards men within the game, of, of, one, of characters beating up and murdering male characters, but she was particularly concerned about the beating up and murdering of female characters within the game. Is that a justified concern? Is it a bit of hype about nothing? That's going to depend a lot on your own personal experiences, viewpoints, philosophies. But it is the kind of concern that gets brought forward about the nature of media and how much impact the media can have. For someone who consumes a lot of a certain type of media, I don't think anyone has ever suggested that someone who watches Child's Play once will be traumatised for life by it. Rather, they're suggesting constant exposure to these kinds of forms of entertainment. It's, it's the repetition, which is Kuei's argument, the constant repetition is the key to causing changes in thought patterns and therefore changes in behaviour. Returning to the unfortunately named Clapper, we come to his ideas such as selective exposure, uh, which is reinforcing his idea there uh, about people 
choosing which paper, newspaper to read or choosing which TV station to watch rather than just sitting there like in lumps, lumps whilst all of the information washes over them. People are selective. I will watch this, I won't watch that. They choose the information they want to hear. And these days we can add, certainly add in social media and the internet to that. In the, instead of the three TV stations that existed when I was growing up, um, we now not only have 500 different TV stations, uh, probably way more than that actually, um, available through um, Sky and, and um, cable and all the rest of it, but you've got a million different websites all claiming to tell you the truth about the world, whether that's about how the Prime Minister is really a giant lizard from another dimension, or whether it's some other tinfoil hat wackadoodle thing, or whether it's something reliable and plausible as information. There's a whole raft of information out there. And so it's not only which newspaper do you read, which TV station do you watch, it's also which websites do you pay attention to, which websites do you ignore. This is added to these days, something that didn't exist in Clapper's um, time when he was researching and writing, that our algorithms monitor our internet usage. Chiefly, they do this in order to sell us more rubbish that we never wanted in the first place. But these days, the, the sale, sale of rubbish extends from way beyond chocolate bars and shoes to include politics, religion, ideologies, belief because the algorithms will monitor if you look at a lot of a particular type of site, and then it will recommend to you more of that particular type of site. If you've got no experience of this, I'd suggest go onto YouTube, listen to some talk by any random politician, just pick one out of thin air, go and listen to their talk. The next time you log on to YouTube, it will recommend to you not only more talks by the same politician, but it will recommend to you talks by other politicians of a similar outlook. So other right-wing ones, other left-wing ones, other centrist ones, etc. In other words, it will keep exposing you to more information of the same sort. It's what these days is referred to as an echo chamber, um, where even without your wanting it to or being aware of that it is doing so, the computer will effectively reinforce whatever your initial interests were. That's also added to through things like Facebook, Twitter, and all these other forms of interactive social media, which give us the capacity to delete friends or um, turn off notifications from certain people. So if somebody says something we don't like, we can just turn them off. And if you get into the habit of deleting, unfriending, anyone who says things you don't much like, very, very rapidly, the only people left to listen to will be the ones who say exactly what you think anyway. And so you never hear any alternative point of view, which is not a healthy way to go. It's certainly something that individuals like um, Jaron Lanier, um, in the realm of science, Jaron Lanier is a computer specialist, um, in the realm of psychology, you've got people like Jordan Peterson. Um, in the realms of sociology, people like Frank Ferreira, warning against these problems that back in the good old days, if there ever were yeah, good old days, you could be exposed to a whole variety of opinions, some you'd agree with, some you'd disagree with, but at least you'd know what they were. It wouldn't be all hearsay and assumption. You really would know what other people thought because they'd tell you. And even if you didn't like it, you'd have heard it. And maybe you'd have thought about it and over time you might have changed your mind or you might have dug your heels and even more, but you would at least know what other points of view were. Whereas as we rush into the 21st century, 20 years into the 21st century, what we see more and more and more and of course, the key issue here for a lot of these individuals making these comments is that for the very young, they have never known it to be any different. For those of us who are of a certain age, we can remember when the world was different. Teenagers cannot remember when the world was different. And that's a real concern. That if you are a teenager, you have never known anything other than a social media echo chamber. 
how do you, as a teenager, cope with points of view you don't understand or you don't agree with if you're never exposed to them? Or very rarely, only by sheer fluke or sheer accident exposed to them. Or if the only thing you know about what that politician thinks or what that bunch of people over there think or what that weird, weird religion on the in the building on the corner of the street believe is something you've heard second, third, fourth hand because you've never directly heard what that individual or that religion or that political party or whatever it is, you've never directly heard what they think. You've only heard some second, third hand account from someone saying to you, oh, they're horrible, they believe so and so, aren't they terrible for believing that? That's as, as close as you've ever got to hearing anything from the horse's mouth. What kind of world are we entering into? A world of heavy duty censorship. But it's not censorship imposed by some terrible tyrant. Some awful idiot telling us we can't hear this, we can't hear that. The awful idiot is us deciding for ourselves what we can't hear, what we are offended by. And it does feel like maybe that's me being old and crabby. But it does feel as if people are getting so hypersensitive these days that they take offence at the slightest thing. And is that a good basis for a democratic society in which ideas fly backwards and forwards? Discussion, exploration, grasping information, grasping knowledge, if people get upset over nothing. I understand getting upset over majorly offensive things, but it seems as if these days offence is taken more and more easily and offend, the taking of offence for some people almost seems to be a hobby and something they quite enjoy doing. Anyway, enough of me moaning. So on to selective perception. This is an idea that has emerged from psychology and has now become part of sociology too, that um, we are inclined to recollect, remember, perceive, understand things in ways that fit our version of the world, that makes sense to us, not accurately. Our perceptions and our memories are not necessarily accurate. They are what we might term rationalised to make sense to us. So examples of, I've given probably most of you at some point in the psychology class, um, there was a, an experiment done in the 1960s by Allport, an American psychologist, who had like a little uh, a video of a fight. No, not not a hot, not a murderous fight, just a push and shoving, um, uh, spat, a bit of aggression, going on between two men on a train. It was an American subway train, if I remember rightly. And he showed this video. Allport showed this video to a bunch of students turned the video off and then asked them a series of questions about what they'd seen. And some of these questions were just innocuous things about you know, how many people were standing up or sitting down and that kind of blood. But the key question that he wanted to get to, that he sort of slipped in under the radar amongst all these other innocuous questions, was who started the fight? And the key issue here, bearing in mind this is America in the 1960s, was that the fight was between a white man and a black man. And almost all of the students, who were by and large white for the most part, when asked, believed that they had seen the black man start the fight. They genuinely thought that's what had happened. When the, the video was played back to them, it, it, it all caught, showed them actually, no, it was the white man who kicked the fight off. But because of their perceptions, their assumptions, the way they viewed the world, Back in the 1960s, the automatic assumption was that black men were more aggressive than white men. Therefore, if a fight started, it would invariably be the black man who started it. And so their, um, well, these days we would probably label such as racist, but their conditioning, shall we put it like that, their expectations and assumptions about the world, formed by things they'd heard on the news, by things they'd been told by friends, by family, by whole raft of people over the course of their young lifetimes 
meant that their memories were affected. So they weren't lying. They weren't deliberately pretending that the black man had started the fight whilst knowing all of it happened. This was more of a, an unconscious bias that had led them to have a false memory. And it's not just memory, it's ongoing active perception. That you see what you expect to see. You hear what you expect to hear. And one person's expectations can of course be different from somebody else's expectations. But if something doesn't fit with what we want, we forget about it, is another key issue. So if someone is, um, all right, well, let's go for some really stereotypical example. If someone is convinced that um, all women are gold diggers, let's say, and they read a succession of newspaper articles about celebrity divorces and this sort of thing. And in one of those articles, it's all about how um, the woman got an enormous amount of alimony from the rich husband. But in the other articles, um, it's a 50-50 split or it goes in the opposite direction. It's, it's a different type of um, news story, a different type of media story. Then what people will pay attention to and remember when they're talking about it afterwards is the stories that fit that one story that fits what they thought was the case and they're likely to forget or skim read over not pay a great deal of attention to those other newspaper stories that don't fit what they preconceivedly believe uh, and that again is part of the selective retention we forget things we don't think are relevant what don't we think is relevant? Anything that doesn't fit our preconceived ideas, our pre-existing ideas. Um, so that will impact on all sorts of news, politics, sport news, and you know, hundreds and one other forms of news, but obviously it particularly also impacts on news related to crime. So we will selectively remember the sorts of crimes, the patterns of crimes, which can include things like the demographics of the victim, the demographics of the criminal, all that sort of thing, which part of town the crime takes place in, so on and so forth, will remember things that st stand out as fitting what we already think of the world, rather than challenging what we think of the world. And that can, of course, apply to fictional crime, going back to your assignment, that does the fictional crime fit expectations? Or does it challenge expectations? What's likely to get a higher audience in terms of viewing figures? A fictional crime show that fits in with what everyone believes anyway, or well, I say everyone, the vast majority of viewers, or a fictional show that goes against the grain and shows something very different that challenges the preconceptions of the viewers. Moving on to Williams and Dickinson, um, they conducted back in the early 90s a review of British newspapers, and tallied up the kinds of crimes and um, other types of articles that were reported in politics, sports, this, that, the other. And they found on average about 30% of any given newspaper, some a little bit more, some a little bit less, but on average about 30%, of column space within newspapers was turned over to the reporting of crime. And much of the crime that was reported was the salacious stuff. Sex and drugs and rock and roll, shop horror gasp types of crime, rather than old lady shoplifts and tin of tuna, boring humdrum crimes. It was scandalous crime, salacious crime. Anything with a bit of sex or extreme violence or sadism or um, titillating type of crime tended to be what the newspapers focused in on. Now, this does not, of course, we've said this loads of times already, um, both in, in these lectures and for those of you who attend the um, sociology methodology lectures there as well, that the, new, the crimes that newspapers report are not the full picture because newspapers don't report boring crimes, crimes that they don't think are worth reporting on. Not unless they're having a really slow news day and they desperately need to fill some column space. That's about the only time they report boring crime. 
the rest of the time they, they go for, as I say, the salacious scandal mongering stuff and they ignore the other crimes. So if a person reads a lot of newspapers, listens to a lot of TV news, because it's exactly the same situation there, um, or, or reads a lot of crime related websites, they're going to come away with a somewhat skewed version of the kinds of crimes that go on. Because they will only hear about the crimes that the media tell them about. They won't hear about all of the crime that takes place. And that's only talking about the crime that even gets caught. The crimes we know about. Obviously nobody, aside from people doing them, knows about the crimes that never get caught and never get reported. And that the police know nothing about either because it never comes to their attention. So it, it's, it's quite a skewed picture our understanding, and this is Williams and Dickinson's point, that the regular consumer of news ends up with a very skewed picture as to what the world is like, particularly when it comes to issues of crime, because they're hearing a very selective representation of stories. Now we could go back to this whole hypodermic thing versus selectivity issue. Is this the newspaper editor saying, right, let's tell people about dirty, filthy sex crimes because we want them to be scared to death of dirty, filthy sex crimes? Or is this the newspaper editor realizing that if they slap in a load of information about sex crimes, they'll sell a damn sight more newspapers than if they only report about benefit fraud and um, shoplifting? And so, in other words, is it the news consumers, the buyers of newspapers, the watchers of, of TV news channels? Is it us lot, the public, who lead? So we want to hear about this type of crime, and therefore the people making money out of reporting crack, oh, fair enough, will tell you loads about that type of crime because we know that's what you want to hear. Or are they telling us about certain sorts of crime because it serves their own agenda? They want us to know about that crime, they don't want us to know about some other type of crime they can't be bothered to report it. And that could be they don't bother to report on it because they think it's just boring, or they don't report on it because maybe there's an unlimited cover-up, maybe whoever it is that's committed that crime has a lot of political clout or wealth or brings pressure to bear to have their crime swept under the carpet, whereas people who don't have that resource can't get their crimes swept under the carpet. You can build a conspiracy theory there for you, just go with the team full hat stuff from earlier. Um, what do you feel is going on? Where do you see the evidence as, as residing in terms of what appears to be going on with the reporting of crime? Let alone anything else. Um, in a similar vein, we've got Schlesinger and Tumble saying that the more um, TV news stations people watch, the more newspapers they read, the more crime they hear about, therefore the more frightened they get of crime. Most especially, you could make the argument, most especially when it comes to local news and local TV, um, sorry, local newspapers compared to national ones. And this is something that would relate to your assignment, for those of you doing the methodologies module, relate to that assignment there, but I think we'll see you've done that already. Um, in the sense that if you are told you live in Bury St Edmunds and you are told that there were five muggings in Bury St Edmunds, that would be a lot more concerning than if you were told there were five muggings in Glasgow, because you might think to yourself, well, glad I don't live in Glasgow. Um, but it seems too distant for you to feel frightened of. Whereas something you've, t you've been told happened a mile away from where you live is a lot more frightening than something you've been told that happened 500 miles away from where you live. So the locality of it becomes more concerning. But even if it is something geographically distant, if you keep hearing about patterns of crime, going back, for example, to what we were saying at the start of this lecture, around the idea that uh, TV fictional crime, the victims are often pretty young actresses. Uh, and so it creates this notion that women, particularly young women, are very vulnerable, are very likely to be victims of crime. It perpetuates the notion that certain groups of people ought to be afraid. You could equally make the flip side argument of this. The, as we were saying earlier, the statistics show that the majority of victims of violent crime, especially street crime, but quite a chunk of domestic crime as well, are men. But we don't see much of that on the screens 
therefore are the people who ought to be concerned for their own safety walking around totally oblivious to the dangers and risks that they're at. So not only does it necessarily perhaps make one group of people unnecessarily frightened, it maybe makes another group of people unnecessarily complacent by not pointing out to them, well, actually, you are that very demographic that's quite likely to get smashed in the face with a, a beer bottle or stabbed in the street fight or attacked by someone in your own home, maybe a, a friend or relative in your own home. So does it make them complacent, oblivious, and maybe increase the risk because they're not paying attention to it? They don't even realize the risk is there in the first place. So you can understand that going in two different directions at the same time. That might lead people to change their patterns of behavior. If you believe there are certain parts of the town or community where you live that are dangerous, well, you're not likely to go there only if you believe they're dangerous. Or if you, um, feel that you are in a group or one of your relatives is in a group that is particularly at risk then you might be very conscious of your own safety or very conscious for their safety and rather than saying walk home you might say well no give me a phone call i'll come and pick you up because i don't want you walking home at that time of night through that part of town whereas to another relative who you don't perceive as being at risk you might not make that offer so there could be an impact on changes in behavior of people being nervous of either going out at all or nervous of at least going out at certain times or in, or going to certain places or it could change behavior that people go and buy a burger alarm or they go and toughen up their home security certain parts of the world go and buy a gun um, to protect themselves because they perceive themselves to be at risk because of what they've seen on films in tv shows read in newspapers and so on There are arguably misrepresentations that take place within the media and some of them have been charted and uh, given labels. So the not me fallacy is the notion that some people have that people like me do not commit crimes. I'm not likely to commit a crime. I don't watch TV shows involving people like me committing crimes. Um, therefore, I am not that sort of person. However, however, I have seen lots of um, news reporting or TV shows about people like that one who lives next door to me committing crimes. So I know that the person next door is quite likely to be a possible criminal because I keep seeing people just like that on TV or in newspaper reports. So whilst I'm not likely, the person next door is much more likely. And not only does this not me fancy extend to the notion of who is a likely criminal, but it also extends to the notion of who is a likely victim. So again, coming back to the very thing we just said, if I rarely see people like me being victimized by crime on telly or on newspapers, then I'm, I'm never likely to think of myself as a potential victim, and so never likely to take any precautions to protect myself. because it doesn't occur to me that I could be a victim of crime. Maybe some types of crime more so than other types of crime. This isn't necessarily just violent crime we're talking about. Um, so the notion of who is most likely to be conned out of money. Well, a lot of people might be worried that their grandparents will be conned out of money and perceive their grandparents as perhaps more vulnerable, more gullible, more easily duped by dodgy characters who either come to their doorstep or send them you know, it's peculiar emails. I'm sure we've all had emails saying that uh, the Nigerian prince has $50 million to hide in a bank account and will we send them our bank details? I, I would hope none of you ever have, but let's face it, they wouldn't keep sending those emails out if they didn't get a fair percentage of, of naive, gullible people answering them. Those emails must work frequently enough for them to bother keep sending them out. So who is it that thinks some mysterious Nigerian prince wants to put $50 million into their bank account? There is a popular perception, I have no idea what the statistics on this are, but there is a popular perception, and I've seen a few um, crime watch type programs flagging this up, saying, oh, 
uh, elderly lady conned by this, elderly man conned by that, notion that the elderly are particularly vulnerable because maybe they don't understand the internet quite as well, maybe they're more trusting, maybe they're less streetwise and savvy, blah, blah, blah. Whether any of that is actually true or not, I don't know, but that's often a popular perception put out there, that certain demographics are more vulnerable to certain crimes, and so not just violent crimes, but in all sorts of crimes, that certain groups of people are much more vulnerable to them than other groups of people are. Just as certain types of people are much more likely to commit those crimes than other types of people apparently are. Um, we also have things like the ingenuity fallacy, the social class fallacy, and the victim fallacy. Um, we'll pick up on some of these ideas as we go along, but the ingenuity fallacy uh, deals with this um, notion that criminals are super duper clever and ingenious and, and come up with brilliant schemes and brilliant ideas. So the guy in the photograph here, for anyone who, some of you will recognize him, I'm sure, but for anyone who doesn't, um, in the um, Sherlock TV show, the one with Benedict Cumberbatch, as Sherlock Holmes, um, this, this actor plays Professor Moriarty, the arch villain, the arch criminal, who in both this slightly weird TV version and in the original books is, is a genius, one of the cleverest people in the world, but who has turned his cleverness to the commission of crime rather than to anything more socially appropriate. And so a lot of, of novels and TV shows and films have super criminals, not just bog standard criminals, but super duper clever ones who come up with really convoluted, really um, cunning schemes by which to commit their crimes. And it's only because they have a super duper clever detective on their track that they're eventually caught because the ordinary police are just not clever enough to um, gain an insight into these super duper clever criminals. Now, there probably are in the real world some criminals who are very clever and clearly there are criminals who get away with their crimes for a very long period of time especially if we're thinking organized crimes like mafia bosses and drug cartel barons and that sort of thing the ones at the top of the pecking order you have to assume that they must be reasonably clever to stay at the top of the pecking order for any length of time um, however they are very few and very far between the vast majority of criminals are not super clever and there are some criminals who get away with it for a long period of time who turn out not to be clever either. Um, the Green River Killer in America who um, raped and murdered a whole string of people over a course of years, uh, when they finally caught him, turned out to have an IQ that was subnormal. He, he was very, very limited in his mental capacities. But by sheer fluke, he hadn't left much evidence behind him when committing these crimes. And so it's taken a long time for the police to track him down. Not because he was so super duper clever, but by just sheer, sheer luck, really, as much as anything else that he'd got away with it for as long as he had. Um, so this, this notion of ingenuity, um, not only factors in the, the supposed cleverness of the criminal, but also the idea that crimes are planned and intricate and take place, sort of involve a lot of forethought when actually the evidence suggests the vast majority of crime that takes place is opportunistic, something done on a whim. Um, almost a bit like a, uh, an eight-year-old in a sweet shop who just reaches out and, and grabs a Mars bar and walks out with it without any great thought or planning. It's more of a spontaneous thing. But even the crimes of adults are frequently at that level. An awful lot of violence, quite a few murders, are committed in the heat of the moment. There's no planning, there's no lacing the tea with arsenic six months in advance. It's just people get into an argument, they have a rage, they pick up the nearest object and smash someone on the head with it or see them or what are they going to do? And suddenly that person is dead or, or grievously injured. There's no great cleverness involved in any of it. it it's rage driven. Just as an awful lot of stealing is impulse driven. They see something, they want it, they grab it. The um, terribly involved bank heists and uh, 
things that involve months and months of planning and disguises and this and that and the other that make great films and great cinema seldom happen. It's much more of a smash and grab most of the time than a cleverly planned operation. But thick criminals doing thick crimes doesn't make for very interesting TV. TV wants guys like Moriarty, the super duper clever ones, that makes for more interesting viewing. So that's the ingenuity fallacy. Really. Um, just before we get on to the talking about gender and media re relationships, the social class fallacy is that um, crimes of violence and crimes of property are predominantly carried out by working class people in working class areas. Um, that, that rather Victorian perception that they are the working classes, they all go and drink themselves stupid on a weekend and beat each other up. Which obviously does happen. It's not saying it never happens, but it's also pointing out that there's a fair amount of domestic violence and drunken violence between middle class people and between upper class people. And that, as we sometimes find out, once in a blue moon there's a scandal. It often turns out that city executives getting paid 150 grand a year sometimes go and embezzle their companies for millions because apparently 150 grand a year just isn't enough money for them. So it's not simply poor people nicking things, it's people who've got a ton of money also nicking things. It's just that what they nick tends to be a different type of thing to, to the sort of stuff that the working class is still. So working class people seldom get the chance to embezzle millions because they, they don't have access to millions in the first place. Whereas the upper middle and upper classes who do have access to millions of pounds through their, their employment and so forth, they are the ones more likely to engage in that sort of crime. But you do also get very wealthy people who go shoplifting and steal things that they could easily afford to pay for. They maybe just enjoy the thrill of shoplifting or it's become a bit of a compulsion. Um, just as likely to get people from wealthy backgrounds raping as you are people from poor backgrounds raping. It's, so the, the notion of crime being centred in certain social classes and the geographical areas, the parts of town where the majority of people from those classes live is misleading. Um, the victim fallacy, again, is this idea that certain people are much more likely to be victims than others, which frequently turns out to be untrue, or also that victims engage in behaviours that can make them Victim. This is not quite victim blaming per se, but it's the notion that um, you can protect yourself from being a victim by not engaging in certain sorts of behaviour, which could include things like how you dress, or which part of town you go to at night, all that sort of thing. And it often turns out not to, to be the quite the clear cut case that the assumptions suggest, because frequently those assumptions are based upon works of fiction, TV shows, etc., or based upon the highly selective and sometimes unreliable reporting in newspapers and on TV news stations that lead people to reach conclusions based on false evidence, misleading evidence. Anyway, back to the gender and media um, element here. So we've, we've talked about this sort of victim fallacy about the kinds of people likely to be victims of crimes. Um, in TV land, they're usually much prettier than necessarily you'd find in other situations because the media is inclined to glamorise, just as actually they glamour frequently glamorise the perpetrators of crime. If you remember back a uh, month or two ago now, when we were still meeting back before Corona, we talked about um, the Lonely Hearts Killers um, who lured um, well-off widows into um, signing over their fortunes and um, then murder them. And I showed you a clip of the film version um, with, was it Selma Hayek, I think, and I can't remember the other person. Anyway, two very glamorous Hollywood actors playing the lead roles. And then I showed you a photograph of the actual two killers, 
who didn't look remotely like the two Hollywood actors playing them. They, they, they were quite ordinary, somewhat frumpy, let's face it, looking people in the photograph, the real killers, whereas the Hollywood actors were very, very glamorous. So it's not just the victims who are often glamorized as terribly pretty actors and terribly pretty, and not mainly terribly pretty actresses, once in a blue moon, a pretty actor. Um, but it's also the perpetrators of crime who are frequently the, the casting choices glamorize. That's the nature of media, to cast a glamour. Um, Statistics-wise, so as you can see there, um, in terms of home office stats from Britain, um, so you can look at other countries with their stats in other parts of it, but from Britain in uh, 2017, um, violent crime was 68% lower than it had been in 1995. So British society in 2017, if you follow these statistics, was safer than it had been in 1995. Do we feel safer? Some of you possibly weren't even alive in 1995. <laughs> Trying to work that one out, would you have been? Um, we are constantly told we've got to be on our guard, we've got to be conscious of crime, conscious of risks and threats. Um, but actually, the statistics show that a great deal of crime is dropping. Now, is it dropping because there's less of it? Is it dropping because they don't get called as often as they used to get called? Even though forensic techniques are a damn sight better now than they used to be, so the chances of people getting caught are actually, in, in terms of the forensic research, significantly improved. But maybe, maybe there is less crime because actually there is less being committed in the first place. Therefore, fewer people getting caught for doing it. Is society, is British society, at least maybe not everywhere, but is British society safer now than it used to be? Are we on a downward track when it comes to crime as we gradually get safer and safer? It'd be lovely to think that we are, but is that the story that the media is putting out to us? That we're safe, stop moaning yourself. Um, also 2017, of the um, victims of violent crime, and this is a bit of statistics to back up what I was saying earlier. 61% of them were male, and 39% female. Um, the amount of violence dished out, so whether it was a, a black eye or a broken arm, for example, different levels of violence, um, the male victims of violence tended to suffer much more serious injuries than the female victims of violence tended to suffer. Um, so not only were there more men being attacked, but they were being attacked in a more brutal fashion than women were being attacked. Now, that doesn't mean that none of those women were attacked in a very, very violent fashion. This is just um, averages of levels of violence rather than an individual case-by-case -case basis. And these are just the people who go and report the levels of violence. So I, I'm sure there must be people who maybe got a, a black eye or something in the fight who didn't go to the police and didn't report it because they didn't regard it as sufficiently serious. So these are cases deemed sufficiently serious by the victims or by family or witnesses or what have you, that the police got caught. So there's probably a lot more violence out there going on that's not being noted, but maybe a, a relatively low level of violence going on out there. Of all the people that were known to be murdered in 2017, 74% of them were men. Is that a pattern reflected in the media, in TV shows and so on? And again, this is something you could bring out if, depending on the nature of the TV show or film you're analysing, how it compares to these types of statistics, these types of um, demonstrable patterns of crime that go on. Um, so some of this we've mentioned previously, but uh, a degree of selectivity goes on. Um, Galton and Rouge we've mentioned previously, and we'll go back to them again next week in a little bit more detail. Um, what news gets reported in papers, on TV, and of course these days focused on through social media? News that has some, uh, sorry, crimes that have some degree of drama to them, some shock, horror, gasp, personal human interest to them. So for example, the media is much more likely to go on about crimes against children than crimes against adults or crimes against frail pensioners than crimes against 40 year olds so certain forms of crime have more drama to them more 
human interest to them than other types of crime do, so they're much more likely to get the attention. Um, if there is an involvement with a celebrity, and it was the victim or perpetrator or a witness or whatever they might be, to a crime that's likely to hit the news far more intensively than crimes involving very ordinary people who have no great status or wealth or power or significance. Um, if it's a dead simple straightforward crime, that's much more likely to get attention than the a confusingly complicated and morally ambiguous crime is because the media likes things straightforward, it doesn't like confusion. And um, possibly that's because their readers and watchers don't like confusion either, they want it straightforward. Weird crime is popular. Um, perverse, peculiar crime is very popular. Um, the more violent, the better, as far as the media is concerned. A black eye doesn't sell anywhere near as well as a disembowelment does. So the more gruesome the level of violence, the more the media laps it up. And is it, in fairness to journalists and so forth, is it just the sleazy journalist type idea going on here, or is it actually the consuming public, i.e. us lot, who are doing the lapping up? Is it that we are blood hungry, or is it that the journalists are blood hungry? It's a little bit like going back to the days of the ancient Roman gladiators in the arenas. Um, do we say, oh, the emperor is terribly and cruel, look, they're putting on these violent murderous shows, or do we look at the thousands of people thronging the stadium, burning their tickets, cheering and jeering and howling, and enjoying every death, every blood splatter, every scream of pain? Who is the one to blame here? The, the emperor for staging it or the public for buying into it? It's an old phrase that's popular in newspapers and the media generally, if it bleeds, it leads. So the headline stories are the gory, painful, and pleasant ones, rather than the, the bland and more humdrum ones. Um, Quistra and Mahoney put forward the argument back in 99, and you could say maybe in these days, especially with social media, it's got worse and worse, that the amount of fact covered in crime reporting gets less and less and the amount of exaggeration, hyperbole, tweaking the facts to make them more dramatic, or in other words, lying, <laughs> gets more and more pronounced. So what you theoretically view as a, a factual news story is often virtually a form of fiction because so much of it has been chopped and changed to sensationalize it and make it more entertaining and more you know, engaging. That, uh, and you could argue this about documentaries on TV um, you know, true life crime documentaries, how true is half of it? Or are they virtually turning it into a work of fiction? Uh, Ray Suet comes up with the law of opposites back in the late 90s to argue that what we see in fiction, films, TV shows, and the rest of it, the, the very thing you're looking at in that uh, media analysis, is frequently the dead opposite of what you'd actually find in the real world. Um, so, you know, the kinds of crimes we get on TV shows, it's murder and gore and mayhem and depraved sexual activities, whereas by and large, most of the crime that happens is rather humdrum, rather boring property crime. People stealing things, people vandalizing things, people embezzling. It's, it's small scale property crime, stealing cars, shoplifting, and that rather doesn't make good TV. The majority of murders that take place are street violence, you know, pub brawls that end up with someone dead, um, or domestic disputes, husband murders, wife, wife murders, husband, and the most obvious person is the one that did it. So there's, there's no great mystery for Hercule Poirot to solve because it's bleeding obvious, but that would make for a very boring TV show, and so Surette's argument is that you end up with these really convoluted plots where the, the least obvious person turns out to be the guilty party. That very rarely happens in real life. Uh, and whilst an hour's TV show needs to drag the plot out over the course of an hour, in real life, you kind of turn up and go, oh, you did it. <laughs> Within five minutes, it's done and solved because the obvious person did it, by and large. You know, this person did it. It's usually the husband or usually the wife or usually that drunken idiot in the pub that did it. But doesn't make for good TV. Um, 
um, a lot of TV crime involves, going back to the masked strangers we were talking about earlier, these sinister figures who turn out to be the long lost relative that everyone thought was dead for 30 years, but comes back to murder everyone in order to claim an inheritance. And it's all very bizarre and convoluted and involved. When in, in fact, very rarely are people like that at the root of crime. They do exist, clearly they exist. We know there are serial killers out there who go and kill random strangers they pluck off the streets, but they are very few and very far between. The vast majority of people who are the victim of violent crime or sex crime are molested or assaulted by someone they know, an immediate relative. More children, sad to say, more children are molested through incest than are molested by um, total strangers who've, who've abducted them from the park. Um, the bit about fictional villains being, um, by and large, posh, middle-aged white men, the, the, the villains du jour, these days at least, um, whereas an awful lot of crime is committed by younger people, is committed by people from all sorts of different ethnic backgrounds and groups, crime committed by women and so on, doesn't, so when it, with a lot of these fictional villains, are like, often it's the um, almost like super villains, your Batman and the Joker and things like that, that kind of level of, of fictionalized villain often fits into that sort of um, pattern. And you could make the argument, you know, a sociological argument, that if a certain type of person again and again and again is cast as the role of villain in works of fiction. Does this show us how a given society in that given historical era views badness? That, oh, well, it's okay to say that type of person is the baddie because who cares about that? And there is a degree of resentment. If somebody has high status, clearly, someone that cares about them enough to accrue them high status. But is this reflective, for example, of a degree of resentment? Because of this, a bit like Midsummer Murders, where it frequently turns out murders in mansion houses and uh, they're all terribly posh and they live in wonderful thatched cottages and villages that probably cost half a million quid to, to buy such a cottage. And frequently it turns out the villain is the lord of the manor or the lady of the manor, something like that. That, that quite sort of unrealistic forms of crime and, and the sorts of people perpetuating crime are um, caricatures of frequently terribly posh people. Is there a degree of sort of resentment going on there, a bit of uh, proletarian angst about, you know, what these dreadful rich people are like? Is it any surprise that they turn out to be murderers and rapists and one thing or another? And so there's a bit of a demonising going on there of a group of people who normally enjoy high status, but whose very high status perhaps is the exact thing that earns them the resentment from layer down the pecking order, and you get that degree of, of resentment. We mentioned earlier this, this notion that all crime gets resolved by the end of the TV episode or the end of the film. Um, the, the, the goodies always get the bad ears. Well, in real life, a lot of crime goes unresolved. And you can look up the stats on unresolved crime, it's a little bit depressing, but <laughs> a lot of it does go unresolved. But again, that doesn't make for good TV if the baddie gets away with it by the end of the show, or even remains completely unidentified. You can you imagine getting to the end of a Hercule Poirot episode and Poirot goes, I do not know, because this is a crime, I have no idea. And then the credits roll. <laughs> so it wouldn't be a very popular version, would it? of of uh, crime show. Uh, moral panics we mentioned earlier um, in regard to Stanley Cohen initially advancing the idea of moral panics. I was, uh, wrote a series of books and journal articles and whatnot on this idea of society whipping up hysteria, whipping up anxiety and moral panic, uh, particularly as the media grew. So in, in earlier periods of history, it was sometimes politicians and sometimes religious leaders using the pulpit to you know, panic their congregations and convince them 
that there were sinister forces at play, but that was very small scale because in, well, depending on which period of history we're looking at, media as such didn't really exist in the way we understand media today at least. Whereas these days we have very large scale media, global media drowning us every minute of every day in the media. And so it's very, very easy to whip up major panics. Um, there are some critiques to these ideas. So Frank Ferreira, for example, puts out the critique that you can only really have a moral panic in a community that has a cohesive moral basis in the first place. So if most people in the community share the same basic set of values, then you can panic them. If they don't, if you've got a very multicultural society with lots of different values and from lots of different subgroups with different values from each other, then it's difficult to whip them all up into a panic at the same time. However, Freddy says that these days we're much more likely to see health scares than we are to see more old fashioned types of moral panic, because even with all of the different multicultural setups, the one thing that concerns just about everyone, no matter what culture they're from, is the state of their health. And so you can have real panics around things like obesity, viruses, quite obviously, um, you know, drug addictions, or the amount of alcohol people in the society consume. Worries around people's health is a much easier way of whipping them up into a state of anxiety. And the sorts of fears and concerns that people had 50 years or 100 years ago when there was a, a greater degree of moral unity within, well, within British society, but within any society for that matter. Um, Miller and Riley make this argument that um, whipping up anxiety and angst through newspapers, TV news, anything else you get to think of, is a good way of softening people up, making them more malleable, more controllable. Because if you can convince people that there is a major threat that they should be afraid of, afraid of, in one breath, in your next breath, you can offer to sell them a solution. And I'm saying selling here because one of the arguments made um, by Cohen and Faraday and various others is that, a, that often where there is a major panic, there is also some sleazebag profiting from that panic, profiting financially, using it to their, their advantage. But what Miller and Riley are arguing is not necessarily financial gain, but more ideological gain, more of a power grab. Convince people there's a real threat and then convince them that you know the solution to that threat and they will do as they're told. They'll listen to you. They'll be dependent on you, like frightened children depending on the mum or dad to protect them. Uh, it's, it's a similar idea was advanced by Foucault. And really. Miller and Riley are building on Foucault's ideas uh, that fear is a strong form of um, biopower. That's a strong form of political control over the population. That uh, it keeps them afraid, it keeps them reliant, it keeps them dependent. So you could look, for example, if we're thinking kind of criminal issues and so on, um, panics around terrorism. These days, of course, the big fear in newspapers and so on is around Islamic terrorism. Um, go back to when I was young, the big fear is the IRA and Irish terrorism. So different terrorist groups at different points in history you go back to late Victorian, early Edwardian times and people were terrified of Russian terrorists. The Bolshevik revolution coming over here, uh, they were seeing sinister Russians in every street corner um, rather than worrying about Irish terrorists or these days worrying about Islamic terrorists and give it another 50 years, who knows who will be told is the big terrorist threat. So terrorism, regardless of who it is that's doing it, is a prominent concern of the media. They go on and on and on about it, or at least they used to before they were going on and on and on about coronavirus. Um, and it's a good way of manipulating people. It's a divide and conquer tactic. Who do you have to keep an eye on? Who should you be wary of? What should you be looking out for? Is it safe to go to public events or is some psychopath going to try and blow you up or shoot you or do whatever the hell they're going to do to you? It's means of arguably manipulating. And one of the concerns of people like Miller and Riley is that the political measures, the legal changes brought in to 
supposedly keep the public safe from terrorists can also include a lot of rather dodgy policies that establish even more power for those in the elite over the rest of us and that we as the public can be suckered in to agreeing to these rather dodgy control methods because we have been sold on this idea that it is for our own greater good and our own greater safety. Going back a few decades, there was a big media focus on stranger danger. Uh, they used to have posters put up around schools and youth clubs and places like that to warn children against going off with dirty old men in rain backs. And that sinister strangers would go up to them and say, would you like to see my papa? And try and lure them away and do unspeakable things to them. And of course that does happen, we know that does happen. But it, the, the key um, issue that was flagged up in the aftermath of the Stranger Danger campaign was that actually it is a very rare crime. It doesn't happen that often that some weirdo in a rain rack comes up to a kid and tries to lure them into the park with promises of puppies or whatever it might be. Much more common, much more worrying, is the fact that children who get molested and, and sometimes murdered as well, of course, are most likely to be molested and potentially murdered by someone they know, by a relative father, stepfather, uncle, stepmother, you know, not, not always just me either. Um, they're more likely to be subject to horrible abuse by a relative or by a family friend or by someone they trust, like a, a teacher or a, a youth club leader or you know, somebody of that sort. And someone that, not some weird stranger luring them away in the park, but by someone they know perfectly well. And that assault is much more likely to happen indoors rather than again weirdos approaching them in the street or in the park it's much more likely that they're, they're at school they're at the youth club they're at home and that is where the assault will take place and so whilst there is nothing per se wrong in warning children not to go off with creepy weirdos who want to show them puppies the argument from campaign groups was that there should have been as much if not more attention paid to the type of crime that's statistically much more likely to happen advising children what to do if a relative or some known person abuses them and there have of course been in the NSPCC have campaigns that have been on tv in the last few years which address issues like domestic violence incest and so forth um so that has happened it's now moved from just concerns around weirdo strangers to a growing awareness that children are much more vulnerable to relatives and known adults and advice being presented to kids and and other adults who might be worried about what's happening to a child they know um, and spot the signs that something dodgy is going on, what should they do? So that advice is now being put out there. So there has been a, a recognition of this issue that the Stranger Danger campaign was quite limited and put out a somewhat misleading message by flagging up or giving over much attention to something that wasn't that common and totally ignoring something that was more prevalent. And you could say the same can apply to other crimes, not just these really gruesome crimes that can apply to um, other types of crime as well, where media attention is given to something that doesn't happen that often, and very little attention is given to something that happens quite a lot, or at least more often, if, if not per se quite a lot, but certainly more often. So Noam Chomsky, very prominent sociologist, talks about there being various media filters that um, shape and influence the news he's not talking about crime explicitly but the news in general and the media in general that these arguments apply as much to crime as to any other type of topic that might be covered by the media so one of the issues that he wants us all to think about and flag up 
is the issue of ownership. Who owns the media? And more and more and more these days, you get a tiny number of individuals owning virtually everything. So yes, each newspaper will have their own editors, but a lot of those editors are answerable to one person who owns half a dozen different newspapers. And it's worth noting that you, even though it's easy to think in terms of political agendas of, of mass media owners, the media barons, you'll get some media barons who own both left-wing and right-wing newspapers. So they're not promoting only one point of view, they're trying to profit off all points of view. So they'll sell left-wing information to left-wing readers and they'll sell right-wing information to right-wing readers and sit back and watch their bank accounts swell. So one newspaper they own will slag off a politician and the other newspaper they own will praise up exactly the same politician. And um, this is a, a key argument for Chomsky is whilst you do get some super rich people who have a particular axe to grind and will grind that axe relentlessly and constantly. There's also a fair number of super rich people whose, who's, well, only axe, as it were, is to stay super rich and indeed get even richer still. And they'll sell anything to anyone. Left-wing, right-wing, centrist, they don't give a damn as long as they're making money out of it. And the key drive of the media is to make money. And so we're back to this argument that the media will go with whatever sells. They'll try something new, and if it doesn't sell, they'll stop doing it and go try something else to see if it's more popular. So to give you an example, move slightly away from the area of crime, um, there's a, an increasing number of um, TV shows and films that have taken a part which was traditionally played by a man and recast it with an actress, with a woman. A fairly obvious example of that in Britain is Doctor Who, um, but there's plenty of other examples out there. And you could say this is a, a media experimentation. Will, it, will they make more money, get more viewers, more consumers, not just watching it, but buying the DVDs, buying the merchandise and all the rest of it? Will, will their sales go up by putting the woman in the lead? Will they stay exactly the same? It makes no, no great difference one way or the other. Or will their sales go down if the consuming public don't like it? And whether or not this continues to be a persistent pattern is less likely to be informed by the supposed feminist ideologies of the people producing these shows and more likely to be informed by sales figures. Does the money go up? Does the money go down? Does the money stay the same? If it goes down, they'll revert to casting their figures because that's where the money is. If the cash goes up or stays the same, then they will stick with um, casting actresses rather than casting actors. So it's less about, at least as far as Chomsky is concerned, it's less about ideology and flag waving and much more about making a training experiment to see if they can make more money doing it this way than doing it the way they were previously. Um, and part and parcel of that is advertising. That's one, well, obviously, not so much the BBC, but for the commercial or TV channels and for all of the newspapers carry adverts, the people buying the adverts exert control over the, um, the either the newspaper or the TV station, or indeed the website, whatever it is, um, through sponsorship, things like that, they'll say, well, we don't like the kind of program you're putting out, the kind of news you're reporting, we feel that's damaging our image, we'll take our money elsewhere. Whereupon the person in control of that particular form of media is quite likely to turn and say, well, actually, no, 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 don't take your money elsewhere. We will change what we put out to be more suitable to what you want so we can keep your revenue. And so the advertisers aren't 100% calling the shots, but they can use their wealth and their advertising campaigns selectively to say, we don't want to be in that type of, of newspaper or that type of TV show for, for our advert we in the middle of that TV show because we don't feel it sells well to our demographic. We, we'll go somewhere else.
and so they can use their money to, if not pressure, at least encourage those who own the media to adapt to their requirements, which might mean changing shows or dropping certain things or bringing other things in, other themes, issues, topics into their shows or into the kind of news they're reporting in order to fit the demands of the advertiser. Um, there is a media elite, Chomsky says, the sort of not only the journalists themselves, but the owners of the papers, and to some extent you could argue the A-list celebrities, the, one, the really big earners who can use their wealth and their weight and their clout and influence to achieve their own agendas, whatever their, those agendas may be in a given individual. So that may be um, getting into bed metaphorically with high ranking politicians to either cover up their indiscretions if they like that politician and the politician is pushing policies that suit the media elite or indeed vice versa to expose and bring down a politician they don't like whose policies undermine whatever it is that that member of the media elite is trying to achieve. And so those politicians who want to remain in office for more than five minutes learn to play the media game. What to say, what not to say, what policies to promote, what policies to avoid. Because the media have tremendous clout in building up or tearing down politicians, celebrities, you know, lower ranking actors or actresses whose future success depends on how they play the media or fail to. Businesses knowing how to play the media or fail to play the media. There's a whole lot of rather debatable agendas going on here. Um, individual journalists and it's, it's too easy to stereotype all journalists as sleazy and corrupt. Um, they're no more all sleazy and corrupt than the members of any other profession are all sleazy and corrupt. Some are, some aren't. So you will get journalists who want to break a news story that they think is in the public interest. And it's not just some, some bit of sleaze about which famous person is sleeping with which other famous person, but something of genuine public interest. And they may be able to do so. But it's also the case, Chomsky highlights, that there will be occasions when pressure is brought to bear. And that pressure could be brought to bear by a politician, it could be brought to bear by a, a, an industrialist, or indeed the owner of the newspaper who is connected to something. So let's say the, the story the journalist wants to break could undermine the future financial success of a particular business. Well, if the owner of the newspaper has shares in that business, that journalist might get quite a degree of flack to keep their story undercover to not um, endanger the wealth of the newspaper magnate, or at least to give them time to sell their shares and move them somewhere else. Um, the journalist might have some crime-related story involving a favourite politician. Not, they're not favourite to the journalist, but favourite to the editor or to the owner of the newspaper. So pressure might be brought to bear to sweep that under the carpet. But also Chomsky says sometimes it's the public that don't want to hear things, not just some rather corrupt, powerful individual, but the public itself tells certain stories. They just find them distasteful or unpleasant or um, disruptive of, of their view of the world. And so if a journalist tries to push an unpopular story, then the journalist will get that their, their career undermined as a result and is unlikely to push those stories in the future, if they're even being still in work in the future. Um, concerns around common enemies, Chomsky argues, are often to some extent manufactured. The media helps to build up goodies and baddies and to exaggerate the scale of threat that some particular group may pose. And this is building on the ideas of moral panics to a large extent. When you're told to be very afraid of a particular group, sometimes it may be a genuine assessment of a risk actually posed 
but quite frequently, says Chomsky, it's wildly exaggerated. Why is it wildly exaggerated? Well, look to what is going on. Why do you have to be, why does, why does the media want you to be afraid of that thing, that group of people, or that, that um, foreign country, or, or whatever it might be that they're trying to get you afraid of? What is the bigger picture? And so Chomsky sees, sees the media as engaging in quite a degree of manipulation. Now, one thing we might argue here and consider is that 40 years ago, the media could engage in that level of manipulation with relatively little opposition. Nowadays, we're on to internet land, where within five minutes of a news story being broken, there'll be people the world over saying, well, I think this, I think that, I've heard this, I know that from their experience, and claiming different points of view from the one being promoted in the mainstream media. So is this still as viable in the internet age as it used to be pre-internet? Um, or does social media now build up a sufficient um, alternate voice, an unregulated voice, and this perhaps is the key issue with social media, is that you don't have um, um, one person in charge of it. So yes, there is, um, what's he say, Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg in charge of Facebook, for example, but he is not able to control what everyone posts on Facebook in quite the same way as, let's say, Rupert Murdoch is able to control what journalists say in his various newspapers. So Murdoch can exert a greater degree of control over what appears in his papers than Mark Zuckerberg can control what appears on Facebook. Uh, and likewise for any of the other owners of the other forms of social media, they have somewhat more limited control over what is said and done and reported on social media. So the opportunity for individuals, some of whom may be making very valid points and some of whom may be making very quite bizarre, lunatic points of view, um, the genie is out of that bottle. Anyone can say anything to a large extent and it will be repeated and repeated and repeated and some of them will remain tinfoil hat minority opinions, but other opinions will grow and grow and grow in public prominence and then perhaps come to challenge mainstream media narratives. For Chomsky, all media, newspapers, TV, etc., is a form of propaganda pushing differing messages from different power elites. There is not one singular power elite, there are various different billionaires, millionaires, etc., rivaling each other, clashing sometimes with each other, pushing alternative points of view to each other. Um, and so what we are told in the media serves in the long term an agenda, which doesn't mean every single thing is untrue, just that the choice is made, let's tell people about this thing, let's tell them about issue A, but let's not tell them about issue B. The, the selection process behind that is driven by an agenda. It's not quite necessarily, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it doesn't have to be understood in quite that paranoid a way. It's more about those in power wanting to maintain their power, wanting to maintain their wealth, wanting to maintain their influence. And elsewhere, you'll get people who are sort of um, like the young stags challenging the old stags. They're coming into the situation wanting, not having as much power or as much clout, but wanting to build up, wanting to challenge the old guard. And so you'll get clashes between the old guard powerful and the upcoming young upstart power bases clashing against them. You could possibly understand the reporting of crime, um, both real life crime and fictional crime in TV stations and what have you, as possibly a part of that propaganda? Is it pushing certain beliefs, certain issues, certain ideas, certain consumptions, conceptions rather, perhaps? Um, Fuchs says that this is particularly the case with the representation of terrorism, more so than you know, Miss Marple and, and Sherlock Holmes and such like, but uh, films about terrorism, TV shows about terrorism, 
much more fits that kind of agenda pushing understanding than more dated perceptions of crime. Habermas, um, who we've mentioned in the, in the more distant past, says that reporting the facts as human interest stories, mixing information with entertainment, arranging material episodically, and breaking down complex relationships into smaller fragments, all of this comes together to form a syndrome that works to depoliticize public communication. So when he says depoliticize, it's to get us to think about the news, consume the news as a succession of events of things that have happened in the world that um, just happen rather than to think about them in the sense that, well, did this happen because that politician over there instigated so-and-so policy? Or did this happen because some other politician failed to instigate a policy? So rather than seeing world events or national events or, or local events in the context of local, national or world politics, this happens because of the kinds of governments we have, the kind of policies they pass, whether you're talking about the local council or all the way up to um, the governments of vast countries with, with enormous clout. We think of it less in that context and more as just a thing that happens. It takes it out of a political situation and therefore we don't look to political solutions. We don't look to hold individual politicians or parties or governments accountable for their achievements or their failures. Um, so that could be account uh, when I say accountable for their achievements. This could be in terms of praising as well as criticizing. It could be saying, well done on making this thing happen, as well as moaning and complaining about some other thing we wish hadn't happened. So it can go in both directions. But Habermas is saying that the news doesn't want us to think too much about how politics and policy and government decisions and so forth affect the events that happen in, in our neighbourhoods. They want us just to view them as a succession of unrelated events. He also goes on to say that the way news programmes, especially on TV and social media and so on, represent news, turns it more and more and more into a form of entertainment, into a form of fiction, and less and less into reporting just basic facts. Which again is something you might want to work into ideas. Could also potentially be a, an issue you might want to use for a dissertation, maybe. Dissertation idea. Um, is crime a political tool? This is a quote from Theresa May back in 2018. Without advanced surveillance capacities and technologies, we run the risk that murderers will not be caught, terrorist plots will go undetected, drug traffickers will go unchallenged, child abusers will not be stopped, and slave drivers will continue their whole trading human beings. Um, therefore, the government must have better means to conduct surveillance, to spy upon the public and their social media postings and their emails and their phone calls and all the rest of it that more spying means more safety. More monitoring means more safety. Now, we could flag up some dodgy controversial issues involving lost reports on paedophiles, which could be attributed to certain politicians, but we won't go down those routes. Um, but is this a valid argument? Whip, whip people up into a state of anxiety and fear. This is going back to one of the earlier arguments. Made. Whip them up into a state of anxiety and fear about drug traffickers and murderers and terrorists and paedophile gangs and whatnot, and then demand as a politician that the public support your government, your party, your, your tenure in office as having certain powers and authorities to protect them without too much scrutiny as to what the hell else you'll be getting up to utilizing those powers supposedly for protection um, this isn't something specific to the tory party this as much applies to periods of time when the labor party has been in office when we've had um, coalition governments and in other countries with other political parties left wing right wing with the other wing going to what extent does fear of crime and worry about crime provide a useful springboard for politicians to gain themselves powers and advantages which 
the public might be a lot better off if they didn't have. Something to think about. Which brings us to the end, thankfully for my throat and your arrows. So next week, the last lecture, boom, 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 end of term. Um, we'll recap some of the ideas from Gamelton and Rouge, which will be familiar to a lot of you from the methodologies module, but not familiar to all of you. And we'll take on some of the slightly different angles to the ideas that we didn't cover anyway in the methodology one. And talk about Kabotis on crime reporting and some of Duke's ideas. And again, look at ways that you can integrate these conceptions into your final piece of coursework. But here endeth the sermon. Thank you for listening. Take care. Stay safe.